name is Eddie Damstra, and I am the Director of Political Affairs for the Notre Dame College Republicans. And I'm going to be introducing Dr. Besser. Um, but first, I'd like to give thanks to some organizations that uh, made this talk possible. Um, so the Notre Dame College Republicans and the Young Americans for Freedom sponsored this event. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, the members of the College Republicans and also our friends at YAF um, for helping make this event possible. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the AAJ Foundation, um, and particularly the Critical Thinking Unit um, that is founded by the AAJ Foundation and the Ideas Beyond Borders organization um, because they funded this event. So thank you to that organization. Um, and so moving on to how the talk will work, Dr. Jasser is going to speak for around 40 minutes, um, leaving around 20 for the Q&A session. Um, and the Q&A session is going to operate a little bit differently, differently than some of you might be used to. Um, we're going to pass around bill cards. Um, and Luke's doing that right now. Um, and so during the talk, as you think of questions, just write down your question on a note card. And at the conclusion of the talk, we'll have you pass them down the aisle. Um, and then I will ask the question to Dr. Jasser. Um, this way, it'll work faster, and hopefully more people will be able to ask their questions. So please, as you're listening to Dr. Jasser, and as you're thinking of questions, um, write those down um, during the talk. Um, now I would like to introduce Dr. Zubi Jasser. Um, Dr. Jasser is an American Muslim and son of Syrian immigrants who fled Baptist depression in 1966. Um, Zubi is a physician, a former U.S. Navy officer, president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, founded in 2003 and co-founder of the Muslim Reform Movement. Um, and AIFD confronts the root cause of Islamist-inspired terror, uh, Islamism and its identity movements. His calls for reform inspired his co-founding of the Muslim Reform Movement in 2015. Um, Zubi is a former commissioner and vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, um, which was appointed by the U.S. Senate, and he served from 2012 to 2016. An internationally recognized expert of Islamism, Zudi is widely published in the field and is featured in many top tier media. He regularly testifies to the U.S. Congress on the threat of global Islamism and domestic and foreign counter ideology strategy. And Zudi's work is dedicated to championing universal human rights rooted in an American and Western identity from within the House of Islam. Dr. Jasser's 2013 book from Simon Schuster is A Battle for the Soul of Islam. And so without further ado, uh, would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Jasser to the stage with a warm round of applause. Thank you, Eddie. It's a pleasure to be with you, and thanks for uh, all the uh, organization, and uh, it was great working with the uh, college Republicans, uh, Eddie, and uh, uh, the uh, Young American Foundation uh, Freedom. And uh, all of the, also the AHA and the Critical Thinking Unit, uh, they have been wonderful to work with. Um, and all the partners, including our American Islamic Reform for Democracy and the Reform Movement. Um, so, when we talk about taking on the Islamist establishment, what am I talking about? Uh, you know, often the lens in which we look at the subject of Muslims and Islam is through terror acts, and as we see holding up maybe this afternoon, even in Toronto. Some of you may have seen uh, the vehicular jihad that may have happened. Uh, we don't know exactly who did it, why yet, but uh, just looking at percentages, it seems that it was a deliberate act. And unfortunately, the narrative about what's happening within the House of Islam, what's happening within the Muslim community, is often done through the lens of the whack mole of every incident that happens and trying to figure out how we approach national security. But I'm a doctor. I, during the daytime, I treat disease and treat illness. And as a physician, I don't just treat symptoms. I, I treat disease. I try to make people healthier so that they can enjoy their lives better. And as our country tries to become healthier and more secure, if we simply treat the symptom of terrorism, we're not going to get anywhere. We're going to continue to be a threat, and we'll continue this sort of whack-a-mole program, which doesn't deal with the, the central problem. So the way I look at it is there's a root cause. What's that root cause? And I think ultimately it's the Islamic establishment, the Islamist establishment. And I want to go through some terms with you this afternoon and this evening and um, make sure we're all on the same page. But, you know, if you look at uh, uh, Emerson, I think he laid it out pretty well. He said there are always two parties. 
the party of the past and the party of the future, the establishment and the movement. So after this recent election in the United States, we heard a lot about the establishment and fake news and other things going on. And, and I will tell you that while what's happening in the Muslim world, I think, is hundreds of years still pre-enlightenment, uh, I do believe that some of this narrative is appropriate, which is who is and what is the establishment of the Muslim community. And I hope as you look at this today and as we spend some time together, um, you can frame in your mindset what is the worldview of the Islamists. And uh, we'll get into some of the details of what Islamism is as an ideology. Uh, and uh, many of the Muslim groups that claim to speak on behalf of Muslims in this country don't even want you to use that term, Islamism. And in fact, they invoke terms like Islamophobia uh, because they want anyone who has a conversation about Islam to be afraid of offending people, to be often named a bigot or intolerant. And what it does is it shuts down conversation. And I acknowledge, and there certainly is some palpable bigotry that exists against Muslims, but what is the best way to address that? And I'm going to walk through that today with you. I do think that when you look at the establishment in the Muslim community, it is basically mostly outside this country. Large regimes out of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Pakistan, those are the Islamic establishments. Now, Muslims in America obviously are not beholden to that directly, but I will tell you that the ideas of the leadership in the Muslim community have not changed much from the leadership of the Middle East. And unfortunately, we have not had a revolution of thought within the Muslim consciousness. So the tiers of establishment, I think, there's almost two tiers. There's sort of the, the lay Muslim community in America, which I think most of which are silent, might agree with some of the things I'm going to tell you. And then you've got the Muslim leadership, which are vast, vast majority Islamist in ideology. So how do we take on the establishment and how do we take them on? To introduce you a little bit to myself, I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, as uh, Eddie mentioned, my family escaped Syria as political refugees in the, um, in the mid-60s. And I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin and felt that I could be more Muslim in Mena, Wisconsin than I could in any so-called Muslim country. We had a little mosque, Fox, uh, it's on another slide, but Fox River Valley Mosque, Islamic Center. And I embraced American patriotism and joined the military to not only pay for my medical education, but because I felt that this country gave me the freedom to interpret my faith like nowhere else could. And ultimately, this is relevant to what I'm telling you because what radicalizes the militants, whether this guy in Toronto ends up being a jihadist, uh, the, the jihadist in Nice and Barcelona and Paris and London, on and on. And then obviously the, the jihadist movements in Syria, etc. Um, um, all of those movements are part of a sense of they radicalize Muslims by telling them that they would die for the Islamic State, the Islamic movement, the jihadist movement. And what made me who I am, what inoculated me against radicalization, was the belief that the only thing I ever want to die for is the United States, a country built on a constitution that separated mosque or church and state, but ultimately that told me that I could interpret Islam the way I wanted to, that I could listen to five imams and make up a sixth decision, versus Saudi Arabia or Egypt, where he listened to the one imam out of al Azhar and he declared what's Sharia law and what is not, and then you get imprisoned or jailed or tortured if you question the imam. And it's interesting, even in this country, the uh, American Muslim community will often allow, they'll say, oh no, we let Muslim students and youth in our mosques and in our Sunday schools ask questions. But do they let them question? And I think that's one of the things that I, you know, made me turn out the way I am is I was able to, as a 13-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old, question the existence of God question Islam, question the authenticity of the Quranic script, and be able to come to my own conclusion as I choose today as a Muslim not to drink, not to eat pork, to pray five times a day, to fast, as I choose to do these things, I choose them because I believe they're rational. It made sense to me. If you look at the country with the largest atheism conversion rate in the world is Iran. 
So, Mustafa Akil just wrote a piece in the New York Times three, three weeks ago that said that Islamists need to realize that what they're doing is actually one of the most, if not the greatest danger to the existence of the faith of Islam. That people are leaving Islam in droves because they don't want to be under theocracy. They don't want to live under theocracy. This is an op-ed I wrote for the Arizona Republic in 2014, where I went, and I think this sort of tells you what happens to Muslims that take on the Islamist establishment. I went to my mosque, as we always do, and I still go there, contrary to uh, the uh, false information on the internet. I've never been kicked out of my mosque. I've never been uh, ridiculed uh, uh, personally or by identity, if you will. But what has happened is that I have been chained in my mosque. And in 2014, I was with my family at the largest prayer of the year at the end of Ramadan at Eid al-Futuk, and there was a sermon given by uh, one of the uh, leading moms at the mosque, an attorney in town. And, uh, you know, Ali starts talking about Islamophobia and how we have threats inside and outside the community. So inside the community, there's even folks like a Muslim doctor in town who's on Fox News and, and basically attacks our faith and attacks Palestinians and is pro-Israel, uh, yada, yada, yada. And my son, who was 12 at the time, elbows me and says, you know, Dad, I think he's talking about you. And, and sure enough, it was obvious he was talking about me. This is a mosque in Scottsdale, Arizona, but goes on to basically talk about Quranic passages that talk about Munafiqin. Munafiqin in Arabic means hypocrites. Hypocrites were the way spies were labeled who pretended to be Muslim in the peninsula of Arabia at the foundation of Islam that were actually pagans that pretended to be Muslims so that they could infiltrate and defeat the Muslim community. So, if the sermon, as I wrote about it in this op-ed, if the sermon was given in Saudi Arabia, that would basically be a declaration of apostasy. That somehow I, by criticizing the leadership, by criticizing Hamas, which is what I was doing in 2014 at that time on national television, that somehow I have basically blasphemed and rejected my own faith. So set aside the fact that we can debate the Israeli-Palestinian issue, on each side of it, whatever side they may be, just simply the fact that a Muslim who takes on the establishment thinking, I wasn't at a, at a rally for the Palestinian Union of Students or for the SJP or whatever that might be. I was at the mosque annual prayer for our holiday in which 10 or 15 minutes was spent about even Islamophobes can exist within the Muslim community. So when you say who the establishment is, the establishment are those who lead our community and think that everybody in the community must agree with the victimization complex, must agree with the fact that we as Muslims should collectivize under one idea. So what I write about at our American Islamic Forum for Democracy is that we should be able to put a prayer. I, as a capitalist and conservative in American politics, should be able to pray next to a socialist, a communist, a Democrat, a Green Party member. It should not matter which party I am in my mosque. Since there's so many things we can pray to about, about morality, about humility, about family values, that should be part of this separation of mosque and state, if you will. Now, I know the response of many would be that, well, you know, many American groups don't separate mosque and church and state, so why should Muslims not be a part of that mixture? And I would tell you, this is one of the things I'm going to walk you through today, is that that, that mixture... It's different having that conversation in America in the 21st century versus the conversation in America during the Revolution when Jefferson and Madison were talking about the wall of separation that existed, the establishment clause that I'll talk to you about in a second. So ultimately, Arab revolutions happened in 2011 and I think changed the entire narrative. We, Our mission statement, which I'll show you in a second, about the need to separate mosque and state, which is, I think, the main way to treat the cancer of political Islam. That mission statement, we founded in 2003. And yet no one really understood it until the revolution started. They said, wait a minute, what are you talking about separating mosque and state? And, and on the one hand, you had the Islamists who said, well, separating mosque and state, that's what Saddam Hussein does, that's what Hafez Esad and his son Bashar did. Those are military secular dictatorships. And our response is that the people could find a third or fourth or fifth pathway. 
that there aren't only two choices in the Middle East. And I think what changed with the revolutions is that for so long in the 20th century, we thought that the Middle East and the Muslim consciousness, the Muslim identity was inextricably wedded to being either theocrats or being under military dictatorship. And I would tell you, set aside all the nonsense about Islamophobia, that to me is one of the biggest sort of bigoted concepts that could exist is that, well, the Arab will never get modernity, will never get democracy figured out, so let's just make sure we keep the monarchs and the dictators in place that can make sure that they tamp down radicalism. What I would tell you is, as painful as revolutions can be, there is no way to counter the whack-a-mole radicalization because the, the main stimulus for militancy is these dictatorships using religion as an opium of the masses. And ultimately, the revolutions began, I think, what is going to be a long process of modernization that is going to include, and you don't have to be experts in Sharia on this, the Egyptians had their first election and they elected the Muslim Brotherhood that is very easy to argue was worse than even Obama. But one year of the Muslim Brotherhood running Egypt did more to destroy the ideas of radical Islamism than 60 years of the dictators before it. So if you're going to evolve, and revolutions I think are part of this evolution of society, which you can't evolve without it. You can't say, well, let's put the dictator we like because we want them to quick turn into Jeffersonian Democrats. That's need, that needs a maturation. We're seeing that in Syria, in, where you have regimes that do not just step aside, but will take half the population with them in a genocidal fashion because they will never relinquish power to the people. And in, in exchange for never relinquishing power, they will say, well, if, if, we, if we go away, you're going to be left with a regime run by ISIS or Salafi jihadists, which has become a self-fulfilling prophecy by the Islam regime. Same thing in Saudi Arabia, they allowed their 90% of their population to travel and, and, and dabble in Salafi jihadist ideology, so they pretty much have sealed the fate of the Saudi government by saying that if we walk away, we'll be left with a radical regime. I would tell you that this has proven that Twitter and social media can begin to change that entire, that entire concept. You don't need to become experts in Islamic history to know that even in the Western history, these are all the countries in the West, and these are the, the years, just over 30 years, in which they were involved in massive wars in the 17th century. I'm sorry, yeah, the 17th century uh, uh, related to religious wars against theocrats. Eight million people died in 30 years. And I would posit to you that it appears to me that this is sort of the period that Islam is in right now. Islam is 1,438 plus years old. And it is going right now through a period, I think it's going to be shorter than this because we have social media, things move much more quickly, but it is going to be probably just as bloody, if not worse. And ultimately, hopefully, Middle Eastern governments and the Islamic consciousness can begin to look at how do you establish a society that's based on a national identity that's rooted not in a faith identity, but in a human identity, a universal human rights. And I think that's the beauty of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution and who we are as a country. And all of these things, the concept of Ummah from Muslim. Ummah means faith community, but also in the Quran, it literally means state. So until we Muslims redefine that, you can't develop a real liberal democracy. And I, I call that the de ummatization of Islam. And I think it's possible. You have to end the Islamic statecraft, if you will, where the identity is, is wedded to that. And I'm going to show you a map in a second of the Middle East, and you'll see that all of these states didn't even exist before 1948, before World War II. So to say somehow, one of the reasons that jihadists are so potent at radicalizing Muslims into believing in the global Islamic state, the states, my parents abandoned their Syrian nationalism like that. Not, not that they didn't try to stay, they were in and out of prison, as my grandfather was, and where, you know, but at the end of the day, Syria was only 10, 15 years old. It was a French protectorate under colonial rule. So they left and embraced American nationalism with, with much more passion than the Syrian nationals that they ever had. They had to because there was no revolution that was capable that hadn't been part of the, 
uh, repression of the military regime of the Assad and, and Baathists, if you will. But all of these laws that it's amazing to me that people just don't do their homework. You look at the Sy Syria is called a secular state. Pakistan is called a military secular state, even though it's an Islamic republic, and yet it has laws about blasphemy laws, about apostasy laws. And if their military went to war, if tomorrow, God forbid, Pakistan declared war on India, I guarantee you that the chance of the military of the Pakistani secular government would be a jihadist screen, would be a, a jihadist mission to fight against the non-Muslim uh, military of the Indians, of the Indian government. Same thing if you want to figure out who's on our side in Syria. Many of our families, my family lives in Damascus and Aleppo. If they're fighting against the Assad regime and against ISIS because they want to be free, they want a democracy, then I think they're our allies. If they're fighting for a jihad, whether it's for elections or not, that's not our allies. So jihad, the concept of jihad itself needs to be reformed. This is one slide that sort of is a smattering of where we are today. If you look, there's the products of what you see now today in the Islamic world are the major historical shifts, the 1400 years I mentioned to you, seven, 800 years of dynasties, followed by three, 400 years of Ottoman rule. Again, the dynasties had a lot of critical thinking involved in them. If you look at Maimonides' work, and uh, I would ask you to read Bernard Lewis's book on uh, the Jews of Islam, which was a great book about how, how much the Jewish community was able to write and, and, and do under Islamic rule. Was that a democracy? No, it was not. They were protected, vimmies, if you will. But at the end of the day, you can't hold the Islamic world of this time <coughs> accountable to 18th century American principles, right? And let alone 21st century American principles. So you have to have a historical approach to your review and understanding of what is and what is not Islam. And also, as you look at today's Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, you also have to understand where they came from. So it came from dynasties, followed by Ottomans. The Ottomans were a caliphate, an Islamic state, that prohibited really the study of Arabic. So how could you reform Quranic interpretation if you really aren't able to study the root words of what these words mean? And now you wonder why on Google. You Google what the chapter 5 says about uh, Jews and what uh, uh, it says, for example, do not take Jews and Christians as your friends. That's a misinterpretation that is very prevalent in the Muslim world. Why? Because there's hundreds and hundreds of years of lack of reinterpretation and interpretation and translation. Then you put on top of that some colonialism that had some good with some bad mixed into it. And then nationalism after World War II, where you had a post-colonial vacuum in which militaries came into place. There were military dictatorships, and then ultimately the Arab awakening after that. So right now what you're seeing is you had 1,400 years of a loss of reform and renewal within the Muslim consciousness. The main laboratory where we can do that reform and renewal is here in the West, and we're wasting our time talking about Muslims as victims and the, the, the bigotry that exists against Muslims and, oh, woe is us, and while we squander the laboratory we live in here to, to fix all of these hundreds of years of problems, while the populations in Egypt and Syria are trying to fight for that, and we sit here and well, that our main problem is Israel and the U.S. government. I mean, that's just, that, that's sort of the narrative of where we're at. So I would tell you that the neo-caliphate of today are these 56 Muslim-majority countries, they run an organization called the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Left to their own devices, these guys will kill each other between their governments, right? The Iranians hate the Saudis, the, the, uh, uh, the constant the battles that are happening between them are sectarian divisions. But, but sectarian divisions doesn't mean that they're that different ideologically. So it's like Coke and Pepsi, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're rivals, but ultimately it's the same product. So these guys are what I call the Islamist Mafia, the Islamist establishment. This is the Islamic Mafia. Their governments are run like oppressive, repressive regime. You notice no women in their leadership. Pakistan had one uh, female leader, uh, but ultimately it has not reformed uh, as, as a community. And they vote as one against the West. So if you wonder why the UN spends half of its time dealing with Israel, 
is because these guys go to the block, so they end up putting us on defense. So if there's one thing you get from me from this talk, I hope you realize that it's time for us to take the offense against these guys. Ideological. You're not going to win this war militarily. But we need to take them on as an offense and, and pushing ideas of liberty, holding them accountable. Not just that, oh, okay, the Saudis are showing the movie Black Panther, so therefore they're modernized. Or the Saudis are now going to put a wrestling match in Riyadh, which brings in uh, WWE into Riyadh, so therefore they modernize. I mean, that's, that's almost bigoted, I think, to say that that's how somehow, that's how they show reform. And you're, they get their 2030 plan for the Saudis, who, by the way, is where the OIC is based out of in Riyadh. They basically said that now they, I don't know if you saw King, the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, has done his tour through the United States in the past few weeks and met with Google, met with Intel, and, and all of the uh, technology companies. And he said he's going to, he's on a buying spree of technology to bring it into their country. And yet, where's the talent inside their country? You need free markets. You need you need an, econ an economy that stimulates folks to begin to be creative and, and come up with their own ideas. But yet the constant narrative that they use <laughs> is to fix their own country's problems by buying it from outside because they use fossil fuels and, and uh, natural gas and oil in order to uh, bring money into their country. Until they use the creative ingenuity of their people, they're going to be stuck in the 15th century. These countries, as I mentioned to you all, came up simply in the 20th century. So their national identities are going to not really be that strong when compared to the Islamic jihadist identity of the Islamic State. And make no mistake, while President Obama did not want to call ISIS Islamic, I'm offended that Iran is Islamic Republic, or Pakistan over here is an Islamic Republic, or Saudi Arabia considered itself an Islamic State. <laughs> These should all offend all Muslims because of the way they treat minorities and women and other populations. And yet, you see very little protestation from, you know, a lot of the Islamic groups in America criticize me and say, we're not Islamists, how do you know we're Islamists? Well, why is most of their bandwidth of the websites of the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, if I was, if you look at our organization, if I see what I want to do as a Muslim, I would deal with my main problems that are radicalized in my community. My main problems are many of these regimes. So why aren't our organizations that have the oxygen of freedom here in America and in the West using that bandwidth to target these governments and what they're doing? No, instead they're targeting Israel and America because that's the narrow lens that they look at what they're doing. And I would tell you that ultimately you'll see a lot of their material produced about me broadcast by the Saudis, by the OIC, because they again serve some of their propaganda interests. These are the Islamic states among the Muslim countries. The green are true Islamic states. The light green are Islam as a state religion. Uh, bottom line is you can tell that this is a much bigger problem than ISIS. So ultimately, what is the identity? And I, I think this is how you take on the establishment. Is you begin to develop a Muslim identity that's outside the mosque. You work with Muslim communities to create think tanks, activist groups, organizations that are based in developing an identity that's an American. And this is why I was on the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom. I met with Egyptian government leaders right after the revolution there. And I asked them, what to you is Egyptianism? When we met with the Saudis, we met with some of the women's groups who, some of them are brilliant, and yet they come to you with a niqab, couldn't even really identify what their individual identity was. And yet I would ask them, can you define what Saudi Arabia is as, as an idea? Is, is it an idea different than what it means to be Iranian or what it means to be Syrian? Can you come up with what that identity is? And ultimately, this is what I think the evolution of the revolutions in the Middle East need to do, is to begin to develop what their national identity is. And I think similarly in, in Europe, one of the reasons radical Islam has flourished a lot more in European, in European countries is because their nation, national identity really has no significant meaning often it related to democracy, related to their history, but often it's a racial identity, be it German, French, British, etc. While Americanism is a 
immigrant identity based on an idea, which is the American Constitution. So this is why I think, and if you look, our first freedom in America is religious freedom. It's our first liberty is religious freedom. So I think Europe is going to have to revisit, and this is why I supported Brexit, is the European Union is beginning to dilute its national identity, which I think is one of the main counters to radical Islamism, is, is to tell Muslims that are British that they are British first, and it doesn't interfere with their Muslim identity and their relationship with God to be Muslim. But yet they're British first when it comes to, and look at the statistics. There were more Muslims that signed up to go fight the jihad in Syria than there were in the British military. That's a problem. That's a problem that I think has to do with how they assimilate, if you will, and, and uh, create ideas within the immigrant population of what it means to be British. This is some of the establishments uh, in, in the American Muslim population. I would tell you they sort of follow the money of where these groups came out of. Uh, and uh, we've debated some of them. Uh, Muslim Public Affairs Council out of LA and I had a debate you can find on YouTube about whether the Muslim reform movement is necessary or not. Uh, I, I also have identified these groups as Muslim Brotherhood legacy groups in that if you look in the 60s and 70s, the Muslim Student Association, the Islamic State of North America often initially was started by a lot of foreign funding from Saudi Arabia and Middle Eastern organizations and, and governments. And ultimately, they brought with that the idea of Islamic State identity. So, contrary to public opinion and, and what's written often about the work that we do, we're not looking to take away, away the rights from any of these organizations to say what they want and to have free speech for promoting their Islamist ideas. But these are not the only spokespeople for the Muslim community. And yet, when you look even today to the groups that NBC, CBS, academia look at to speak on behalf of Muslims, 98% come from these groups. And I think it's the problem, one of the, it's one of the main responsible parties, I think, is us Muslims, the silent Muslims that are not starting organizations that can speak on our behalf. But I think ultimately, also the establishment of leadership in America needs to start to look deeper within the Muslim community and not just at what I would call the lowest hanging fruit, which are those identity groups that like to collectivize us as one organization and one community. I think ultimately we, we sometimes use uh, athletic analogies, but you know, if you look at jihad and the battlefield, sort of like a football field, you've got different teams. This is, sorry, it's a Cardinals from Arizona, but you can put Notre Dame in there or any, any football team you want. And the jihadists are obviously on the battlefield. They see everyone outside the Islamic State on the other side of the field. So you've got those who are on the field, you've got the folks cheering in the crowds, and then the folks at home watching on TV. Similarly, the establishment of the Islamist community. There are those who say, oh, we disagree with the terrorists, but yet they don't disagree with the ends. The anti-Israel narrative, the anti-Western narrative, the fact that 9-11 was somehow America's fault because of our foreign policy, versus actually looking at the root of the jihadist ideas, which is that they want to set up Islamic states. They see freedom and liberty, secularism as a threat to their own states and their own ascendancy. <coughs> this is a quick diagram I think that'll show you if you look at all the global communities and you add in that countries that defend religious freedom, 70% of the world lives right now in autocratic nations. You take Russia and China as a huge portion of that, and then you add to that the Islamic, most of the Islamic countries that are the Muslim majority, and that gives you the 70%. <coughs> These countries are those living in freedom in the West, where religious liberty is protected. If you look at Muslim communities right now, we've got those of us who live here in the West, but then Muslim communities in these countries right now Make no mistake, the majority of Muslims in Iran and Saudi Arabia don't want to be subject to those dictatorships. But yet when they speak out, we continue to look at the narrative that somehow we think revolutions and chaos is bad. I would tell you that it's good. Our freedom here in America is a byproduct of a huge era of chaos that happened in Europe with the French revolutions and 
so many other revolutions that were a byproduct of the Enlightenment. So, so I would tell you that chaos in the Middle East, yes, we need to make sure nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction are not involved in these wars, but we also need to start taking sides. We have not done so. And I would tell you that we need to start taking sides with those Muslims that share our values right here. So in the Middle East, it's not binary. Right now, we still to this day, I, I can't believe this is true, but it's still true in 2018 that we are still looking at the Middle East as a binary choice, even though our strategy, I think, for advancing liberty should not be binary. The civil rights movement of today against the establishment is in the mosques. It's in Muslim organizations and Muslim identity groups. And I think we need as a country to start to counter this Islamist mindset. If you will. Our website at the American Islamic Forum for Democracy has this quotation at the front of it, which is, believers conduct yourself with justice and bear with true witness before life, even if it be against yourself, your parents, or your people. So I think we can, in a very almost fundamental way within Islam, counter the Islamists. No different than if you read the Tocqueville's book on democracy in America, you will learn that the founding fathers counted the theocrats by getting to the fundamentals of Christianity, that they wanted a government under God, but not under Christianity, per se, or any specific interpretation of it. And I think similarly, we can find passages in the Quran that can defend an anti-Islamist approach to the Muslim religion. So this is our mission statement to protect freedom through the separation of mosques and states. There are many examples. This is in Syria, a creative project of writing poetry and music to try to remember exactly what's happening in the war-torn areas of Aleppo and Homs and Hama and Damascus. And I think if they're doing this in Syria, where they draw on murals and it gets wiped out within a, a few days later by the regime, yet in the United States, fighting the Islamists is looked upon as Islamophobia. It just doesn't make any sense. So Islamism is another word for political Islam or the Islamic State. If you want to understand what Islamism is, look at the mantra of the Muslim Brotherhood. And for those who are in the MSA that say, well, the Muslim Student Association has nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood, there was a regional meeting of the MSA in LA in which one of the keynote speakers read this and said, Allah is our objective, the Prophet is our leader, the Quran is our law, Jihad is our way, dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. So until the Muslim Brotherhood changes that mantra, I would say the Muslim Brotherhood itself out of Egypt is a terrorist organization, but ideologically, they should be marginalized no different than the Communist Party be marginalized and other really un-American ideas that may be free to be fought and discussed in the United States, but should not be mainstreamed uh, as an ideology. This is the Muslim Brotherhood Revolution Part of the revolution. I don't think the revolution was made in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, but these are the Islamists that are on. Last, in the last minute here, I want to leave you. Many people say, well, what percentage of Muslims agree with you? You're really sort of a mutation of the Muslim community. I can't tell you how far that is from the, from the truth. In Egypt, after Mubarak was ousted by the Revolution 1.0, Revolution 2.0 in Cairo had 10 million people come to the streets to protest the Muslim Brotherhood. In Iran now, in the past few months, we've seen a rolling revolution in which Muslims and others alike are going to the streets in religious centers across Iran in the Green Revolution fighting against the Islamists and what they've done. Now, I would tell you that had Iran not had 30 years of theocracy, I'm not sure that would have woken up the Muslim community about the problem of theocracy. So, I would argue that it's part of their natural maturation. But if you look at these numbers, on the secular side, you've got the, the terrorists like Assad and Saddam Hussein and Qaddafi, who will use any means necessary to maintain military control. On the theocracy side, you've got also the ISIS, Al Qaeda, Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, Jamaat Islamiyah of the world. So these are the two extremes. In between, you have the majority of non-violent Muslims on a continuum from secular to theocratic. The numbers in the revolution show that about 30 to 40 percent will vote with theocratic parties. That's a huge number. So you're talking 1.6 billion people that are Muslim, 30 to 40 percent believe in some type of theocratic party. 
Now, these numbers, I think, are going to decrease with time as the theocrats prove what they are. The secularists got 60 to 70 percent. So now your next question is, well, why didn't they win elections? Well, these guys were divided into 50, 60 parties in Tunisia and Libya and elsewhere. These folks unite under one collective flag, the black flag of Islamism, and they divide it into basically two or three parties at most. So I would tell you that the strategy for the United States over the next century, but at least in this generation, should be fought right here. This is where the hearts and minds battle really is, is this continuum between the theocratic side and the secular side. And I, I do not waste too much time here. This is a military problem, right? But here, the ideologues who believe in Islamic State concept, uh, you know, sort of the Shedi Hamid's of the world, if you look at Shedi Hamid's book out of Brookings, it's called Islamic Exceptionalism. He wrote a book that, just like there's American Exceptionalism, which is what I believe in, He'll tell you there's Islamic exceptionalism that really the Islamists just don't get it right. If they did the Islamic State concept right, it would succeed. I disagree, but that's a debate that we should have. And he's he's always refused to debate me, but hopefully I think we can have this debate about who and what type of guiding identity should exist. Our system should shift from CBE to CBI. Right now we counter violent extremism. I don't even know what that means. But that's pretty much the mission of our government is to counter violent extremism. And the reason we use the CBE title is because that's what the Saudis did. The Saudis are fighting a war against ISIS. Meanwhile, they basically, their ideas are the founding fathers of ISIS. Sort of like uh, going to fight a war against global drugs with cocaine and meth and doing that with the leadership of the Colombian government. Doesn't make sense. They may not want people on the streets and gangs to use drugs, but the bottom line is they're shifting the ideas all over the planet. This is my book that Eddie mentioned, and I do believe it's a battle for the soul of Islam that we're fighting. And, you know, ultimately, we have to evolve. I think the platforms that exist need to be co opted and used in what we're doing. Uh, we We've lost a lot of the battles of the jihadists and the militants and also the, the theocrats. 90% of the Twitter activity in Saudi Arabia is the Wahhabis and the Islamists and Salafis. So that tells you that I think it's not because there are 90% of the population. We don't have a radio free Saudi Arabia happening right now. We don't have a, a ideological offense in this battle. Actually, what these companies are doing right now is actually stopping most of our work because the Islamists are working within these companies to say that folks like me are Islamophobes, so our YouTube channels get shut down and other things, when in fact, the folks who should be helping us in offensive platforms are not doing so. And at the end of the day, if you want to fight, this is real bigotry that happened. Six Muslims were shot dead in a mosque in Quebec not far from where this jihadist attack probably happened today. And yet, the best way to fight this is not to make the West feel guilty and to say that it's because of policies. I think the West, Canadians, Americans, have not seen American Muslims standing up to fight our own fight. So they say, wait a minute, whose side are you on? And it creates a problem of alienation and separatism. So I think the best form, the best way to fight bigotry is for the West to see us leading our own reform. We have a Muslim reform movement that launched in December 2015. We took our declaration and pasted it on the doors of the mosque. This is a mosque that was Saudi funded in Washington, D.C. Look this up. This is the two page declaration. And, and this is the last thing I'll leave you with. We have basically 15 principles of secular governance, national security, human rights that. We've asked mosques to sign on to. We've asked Muslim leaders to sign on to. And it basically says that men and women are equal. It says that people have the right to leave or enter Islam as they wish. There's no, you know, ideas don't have rights, human beings do. Right? I mean, that sounds like something very simple, but at the end of the day, they call it Islamophobia, not bigotry against Muslims, because they want to protect the idea of Islam rather than actually protect the Muslim. So, these are things that I think are a good way to, to find out which Muslims are on our side in this battle and which ones are not. 
We never talk about prisoners of conscience. Great Bedoui sits on a prison languishing in Saudi Arabia, and yet not one, one interview of Mohammed bin Salman from 60 Minutes to Katie Kirk or whoever else he talked to asked him about Great Bedoui and the thousands of prisoners of conscience that are in the cells of Saudi Arabia. And yet when we fought the communists, when we fought the Soviet Union, we were constantly asking them about Natan Sharansky and all the other prisoners of conscience. And it just doesn't make sense. Muslim identity. We heard so much about the Muslims that fit sort of the, the, the template of what it means to be Muslim. And yet, how many of you heard about Delilah Muhammad who won a gold medal? And yet, if the Hajj Ahmed the fencer was the basically the face of being Muslim in America. Why is that? It doesn't make any sense. They should both be, if anything. And yet, Muhammad Ali also becomes renowned as sort of the leading example of what it is to be an American Muslim, which is fine. He did a lot of great things, especially philanthropically. But he also evaded the draft and used his Muslim identity not to serve in Vietnam. So these are things that there should be other role models that exist in our community. Other role models that exist in our community in order to diversify what it means to be Muslim rather than simply those who bring on a victim complex. Um, I'll end on this. There are so many opportunities, and especially in universities, for us to use platforms. After the Manchester bombing, um, Ariana Grande at a concert was attacked by ISIS. Tens died, hundreds were injured, and yet her statement, which is summarized here, said nothing about, even the title of her tour was called the Dangerous Woman Tour. She had an opportunity with millions and millions of followers to engage the real problem as to what's happening in the, in the cultural, political, religious dichotomy that exists between Islamist mindset and Western mindset. And yet, the apologetics that were ignored here were just unbelievable. We put a video out and had a lot of folks trying to engage in social media, popular change here where there was opportunities to do so, and none of that happened. And as we saw the, with what happens with celebrity politics, all you need is a few celebrities to get engaged in, a, in, in an issue and it'll change the civil rights battle that I mentioned to you that should be happening inside the mosques. And ultimately, it never happened. And yet, Ariana Grande, after the shooting in Parkland did everything she could to make a political statement about guns and other things. And yet when it comes to Islamic reform and modernization, we don't do. So look at solutions. I'm going to leave you with a list of uh, uh, we've got a website, takebackislam.com. I have a podcast of Reform This. Our, uh, my Twitter handle is up there uh, for you to follow me. Um, there's a quote from the San Tibi that we constantly use, which is, the secularization of Christianity did not bring about its demise. He would argue that it brought about its liberation to the personal domain. This culture in the West is still very Christian, but it just doesn't have to coerce it in law to be so, because the character of the people is Christian and Jewish in many ways. That is the culture, the character we see. Religion must simply be protected from state exploitation. That's Bassan Tibi, who wrote a book that I would ask you to read. It's called Islamism. So, I hope some of this made sense. I hope we start getting a historical context and begin to look at some of the solutions that I hope we start to take sides in the Muslim community and realize that just those three or four million Muslims that are here in America have a unique responsibility in this laboratory to begin the reforms that can be transplanted into the Middle East and across the world. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Jasser. That was a great, great talk. I'm very appreciated. If you guys could, um, we're going to enter the Q&A session. If you guys could pass your note cards um, towards the middle, um, I think Luke is going to collect them. Um, so any, any of you guys who wrote questions, um, feel free to pass them to Luke.
And just a note, the event was listed until 6.30. Do we have the room for um, some time so we can, you know, feel free to leave whenever you have to, but uh, we, can, we can go a few minutes after here, try to answer these questions. Okay, thank you. I'll try to group these, and uh, I, we don't want to pivot the conversation, so if I bring up something, you can raise your hand. And this just sort of allowed me to address all of your issues and group them so that everybody has their questions addressed. Um, these two are about uh, what percentage of American Muslims share your views? Uh, what percentage of American Muslims support Islamism, and where are the young Muslim leaders? Uh, who are the young Muslim leaders that share your views? Uh, and then I think similar to that, have you had much success in getting Imam or mosque to sign on or acknowledge your organization statements? So uh, these numbers have not been studied. There's a there's an interview I had with uh, who was the attorney that was on CNN in 2010? Um, Spitzer, Elliot Spitzer. So Spitzer had a show on CNN in which. Uh, I was connecting violent Islamism to nonviolent Islamism as being part of the radicalization process. And I gave him a number about 30, 40% of Muslims believe in Islamism. And he basically, you can, you can find it online. He just said, oh, you know what you're talking about. And you've never, this has never been studied. And that's certainly the response of the Islamic organizations. They'll tell you, no, it's simply a small percentage, 5%. Look at the Pew studies uh, that talk about basically the role of Sharia in Muslim life. Um, what you know, we can talk about how to define Islamism. I would tell you that the bottom line is, is that there have been no anti Islamists studying this stuff with the resources to look at American Muslim identities um, and pull that appropriately. I think if you take a, a mindset of academics who believe that Islamism is not a problem or even doesn't exist, I don't think we're going to do the right type of poll. But I don't think that Muslims that come here from the Middle East become Jeffersonian Democrats just by the virtue of coming here uh, or even having grown up here. I think that ultimately we need a foundation of knowledge to change that. So I think the numbers in the Middle East bear out, which is the numbers which I gave you are about 25-30% are Islamists and the rest are non-Islamists. Now just by virtue of not being Islamists doesn't make them hunky-dory and wonderful folks. There's going to be Authoritarians in there and, and folks who believe in a uh, more uh, significant uh, type of uh, dictatorship, if you will. So, you know, you'll we'll see this in the response from the chemical weapons attack. You will see in the past two weeks a ton of Russian propaganda, uh, Arabs, uh, Arab Americans pushing out Assadist information, which basically saying that Assad's fighting against the radicals and that he's a good leader and we should support him. I mean, these are not American ideas. Anyone who knows anything about what's happening in Syria knows that Assad is a fascist dictator, and basically, you know, you're you're pushing forth Russian information. So, you know, if you look at, you know, who are the young leaders? This is really what we're working on, and that is really a good question because that actually is more of our short-term strategy. If you look at our business plan, if you will, for the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, it's not to have Hundred thousand Muslims in the streets marching to what we're doing, or even being able to fill gymnasiums like Isna does at their annual meetings. We're not going to do that yet. That's not where our movement is. What we're trying to do is train leaders. Uh, we have had a few hundred youth come through our Muslim Liberty Project, and uh, they're some of them are graduating out from West Point. They're graduating from Ivy League schools, going to law school, etc. So we have. Points of light here or there that can begin to effectuate change. Uh, but these are folks that have to be ready to take out their family, their parents sometimes, that tell them that the West is all 
hedonistic and, and uh, drugs and sex and rock and roll, and that the Islamic State is the answer. They have to be ready to take on their religious establishment. They have to be ready to be told by imams that they don't have a degree in Sharia, so they can't really think the things they think. So training future leaders is important. At the bottom of our declaration that you'll see online is a list of 15 people that signed it. Uh, Rahil Raza out of uh, Toronto with Muslims facing tomorrow. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, Usama Hassan, an imam out of London with Quilling Foundation, which includes Majid Nawaz, and um, also Eric Mayun out of Portland, who's actually a fellow with American Islamic Forum with us. Uh, Courtney Lonergan, who's our community outreach director out of uh, Phoenix. Um, and you'll see others in that list uh, also. So take a look at that. There's Ezra Nomani, who was a former Wall Street Journal uh, reporter. Uh, so these are not young voices per se, but uh, if you know of any Muslims, I would ask you to tell them to look us up, to join us. Uh, we will support their work in fighting for freedom and liberty. I can't tell you the number of young Muslims that come to me and say, no, I agree with what you're doing, but you know, if we supported you, my family would think that you know, I've left Islam and all this other nonsense. And it's not nonsense for them. I think it's a true tribal pressure that they have, but I think ultimately it's something that we need to be able to respond to. There's a question here about Trump's travel ban. Is it justified? Um, why or why not? Being a sister in refugee, I'm, I'm not. I was born in the U.S. My parents were refugees. Do you agree with it? Uh, you know, I'll tell you that we have to separate what President Trump's policy was, is, as president versus what he said during the campaign. I was very critical of when we talked about, you know, his interview on CNN where he said Islam hates us and we talked about Muslim ban. Uh, I think that he just wasn't <coughs> parsing words uh, appropriately. I think as commander in chief, it is appropriate. Both parties have had presidents that have banned travel from a certain country. So it doesn't, you know, it's not inappropriate for the president as Carter did when he banned travel from Iran for a few years, you know, for a president to say, you know, we don't want travel from certain countries. Now that has translated into a Muslim ban, which I'm not sure I understand other than the courts out of Hawaii and the Ninth Circuit basically holding the president accountable to words he said during the campaign, and thus that must mean he's having a Muslim ban, even though the majority of that country's population, I'm not sure how that relates to us vetting better the populations that come. And I would tell you last on that ban issue, we should have a better vetting mechanism of folks that come to this country. It should not just be, do they belong to terror groups, have we done a background check, but do they ideologically believe in secular liberal democracy? So if they're a Russian, Russian party apparatus, apparatus uh, apparatchiks, if you will, I don't want them coming to the United States no more than I would an Islamist. And yet we don't seem to have any type of ideological vetting other than do they belong to terror groups. In the Cold War, we did vet for communists against communists. And I think we need to reinvigorate that. And one of the solutions I've testified to Congress about is that we need to have a commission on radical Islam. And the president actually did have that as part of his campaign uh, ideas, and I think he should be pushed to, to put that forward so that we have a commission that begins to have an all-government approach to keeping our country safe. Um, so there's a bunch of questions here about foreign policy. What is good American foreign policy to help reform the Islamic establishment? Uh, to what extent do you believe that the trail of influence draws the trail of influence draws to the U.S. and NATO. Are you concerned? I'm not sure I understand that. Does somebody want to own this? No. Are you concerned? Neo neoliberals. I don't know. Um, do you believe that democracy is even possible in Syria? How can U.S. involvement help or hinder? What has kept the Middle East from modernity? Why have they lagged? And how can free speech and discourse be advanced? So, how does U.S. Policy, foreign policy interact with Islamism? So, all these questions about our foreign policy, I think we need to simplify our foreign policy. Right now, 
It's almost as if we talk about Syria and then we talk about today there was a bomb that went off in Afghanistan. 57 were killed with a suicide bombing this morning. But we almost seem to say, oh, that's different than what's happening in Toronto in the afternoon, different than what's happening in Syria. I would say we need to be on the right side of history and realize that a quarter of the world's population, 1.6 billion Muslims, are going through that modernization. This question said, what has kept the Middle East from modernity? I tried to summarize that as quickly as I could before, where I said you had the Ottomans for 400 years. The bottom line is, is and, and Ayan Hirsi Ali and others have talked about this in their books, right? You had the doors of Ishtihad. Ishtihad in Arabic means the critical review of scripture in light of modern day, which is reform. So the doors of reform in Islam shut down in about the 12th, 13th, and 14th century, somewhere in there. They shut down. So there used to be, right now, there's four schools of thought in Sunni Islam and only a couple of Shia Islam. Four schools, Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi, and Maliki are the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence. At the time of those dynasties I mentioned to you, there were 4,000 schools of thought. And that was not even the time era of freedom, but it was much more spread out, there was much more dynamic thinking, and, and there was a, a protection of, of critical thought, if you will. And, and yet, today it's all been whittled down into four schools of thought that are pretty much 80% the same, with very little variance, other than whether you put your hands here or here when you pray, and how far back women should be, whether there should be a curtain between them, or they should be way in the parking lot. That's, that's basically the diversity in Islamic thought right now. There's very little Thought that talks about having men and women next to each other, uh, having them on boards, having equality, uh, you know, all of the things that need reinterpretation have been arrested by military regimes and theocrats and also an apathy among Muslim populations. So we can't give Muslims a complete pass, but there has been an apathy that I think has finally woken up after the Arab week. We can't say that anymore since 2001, that they're apathetic. To their own existence, which was what my grandfather and father thought when they escaped Syria, was that somehow, you know, he quoted, I think it was mentioned, who said that every people deserves the government they have, right? So they, they fought, they would have been out of prison, they said, you know, the hell with this, we're going to America. And they left and became American patriots. And I think in the Middle East now, you can say that that's changing. I just hope America gets on the right side of that history and stops propping up dictators. Others because we're worried about the cost of our gas. Um, so our foreign policy, I think, needs to be looked at through the lens of counter-Islamism and pro-liberty. You can't just be against something and hope that that fixes the problem. It's like fighting drugs in the inner city, right? If you just say, oh, we're against drug use, stop using cocaine, stop alcoholism, whatever it is, unless you're promoting ideas that fill their time, you're not going to fix the problem. So I think similarly, we need to reinvigorate the U.S. Information Agency, which was our public diplomacy program. We need to begin to have not only counter-Islamism, but pro-liberty, and no longer be ashamed or, or sheepish about what America stands for abroad and, and across the planet. And I think that ultimately is the foreign policy. The way we should look at countering violent Islamism is promoting liberty across the Middle East and no longer simply being worried about who our allies are. I mean, look at Turkey. Turkey's a member of NATO. Somebody asked about NATO in there. And yet, the AKP, the Islamist Party, is basically the Muslim Brotherhood of Turkey. They're running that government. Just yesterday, Erdogan said things that basically he was saying that the West is enemies of Muslims. So, and this guy still is a member of Turkey. You know, I think we should think twice about their NATO status and also begin to hold, especially our friends, accountable to our own principles. And, and this one actually asks, how should the U.S. and other free nations hold Islamic states accountable? Look at the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom and how its statute recommends action in the State Department and in Congress. It grades countries based on what we call countries of uh, uh, concern, particular concern, CPCs. And those who are on watch lists, and it says if they're on, if they are a CPC, we should withhold various aid, 
and then have sanctions that follow as a result. So I think it's time that we begin to hold countries, especially our so-called allies, accountable to the human rights problems that exist and no longer just weigh it based on wrestling matches and showing the Black Panther, but also weigh it on releasing prisoners of freedom, prisoners of conscience. Uh, and the other thing that, you know, if you look at Prince Salman's tour, look at all the interviews he had with Western media. He said he was going to do this, this, and that. And while an act of liberation might have some positivity, until he actually protects a judge, and you have an Islamic jurist reinterpret the Sharia that's being used to tell women they can't be third and fourth class, let alone first class equality with men. So until they change the laws and how they're interpreted, what the prince says or does is not very helpful, really. You know, so it's it's sort of like if you want to in America make a change until the Supreme Court rules or until you pass a law, until you pass a law about it, it's not going to be any effectual change just based on a campaign. And I think that's really important. What can we do? I would ask you uh, to further the cause of Muslim reform. Take our declaration. Find Muslim friends and others, uh, organizations. Ask media folks to hold people accountable. There was a, a, a television station in South Dakota that took our declaration and brought in the imam from the local mosque. It's on our, we posted the video on our website. And in an eight minute interview, this anchor, who really knew very little about Islam, went through some of the parts of our declaration and Asked the Imam what he thought about X, Y, and Z. It's pretty simple on our declaration. And in eight minutes, that anchor was able to put that Imam, he looked, he looked like a deer in headlines because somebody finally was asking him, you know, well, your books say that you should kill those who leave Islam, but you say that's not Islamic. So, so which is it? Right? Have they reformed? And I think that's something you can do as the media academia, invite folks like me, there are others in our reform movement uh, and uh, that are talking about the spine issues that are, I think, head of the spear issues. One of them is FGM, female general mutilation that the AHA Foundation and others focus on that frequently because, you know, if you, FGM is female general mutilation. It's about how girls that are born are forced into what the apologists call circumcision, but the reality is it's it's mutilation of their sexual organ in the name of misogyny, in the name of religion. That's done to them. And it's minimized, it's marginalized by the Islamists who say it might be with Islam, it's a tribal thing. But at the end of the day, it's not a surprise when you have an imam in Northern Virginia that gives a sermon and says that, well, this is necessary to be done because girls are born hypersexual and they need that procedure done to them so that they're normal after the procedure. So, that is another, that's not just one little corner of Islamism. It's a tribal patriarchal culture that needs reform in which this symptom, just like terrorism is a symptom of a political disease, FGM is a symptom of the cultural misogyny that exists in that culture that needs reform. Um, let's see, I think we just that. What is the what do you think is the biggest misconception about Islam? Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that Islam is literal, is that ultimately there is a black and white about Islam and that's it. And that uh, you can't reform it. Um, and I will tell you that all religions have gone through a, a phase in which they evolve out of a literalist black and white phase into a phase in which, um, you know, it's amazing. A lot of the Islamists who criticize my work say that I'm not qualified to talk about the media, to talk about these things. And, and yet, when they give you an interpretation, I tell them, where'd you get that from? And they say, well, this and this scholar. I say, well, it sounds like you're speaking for God. And yet, they ultimately by virtue of saying that they know the interpretation of Islam, they basically have said that they are God. And I think this is one of the things that the West went through, is a marginalization that the government is not God. The government and the, the theocrats do not have a right to decide which interpretation of Islam we have. And I think that one of the biggest misconceptions of Islam is that uh, what Muslims predominantly interpret as Islam today is Islam. 
Now, is my belief a majority opinion in the Muslim community? I believe it is. Is that a majority opinion among those speaking out and writing? No, it's a minority opinion, and that's why you know we need support. We need you know the, the antiseptic of sunlight uh, upon our work. Any other questions that I didn't answer that I might have skipped over here? I don't. Don't hesitate. Anyone think that uh, I'm completely wrong? <laughs> Feel free. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.